We are about to start. Get ready. Aber der hat es unten, ja genau, der hat es unten mal angemeldet. Also von hier scheint es das Beste. <lacht> Fighting Hunger. Fighting Hunger are two very strong words. But they're not only words. Fighting Hunger uh, summarize uh, the second of United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, Zero Hunger. And these uh, two strong words become even more interesting and uh, more challenging when you put in the digital era afterwards. And fighting hunger in the digital era is the reason why we all gathered here tonight at the CDTM as it's uh, the spring class 2016 trend seminar topic. And with that being said, I would like to welcome the collaboration partner for this trend seminar. That's the innovation accelerator of the United Nations World Food Program. That is Mario, Bernhard, Hila, Alex and Sandra. Welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Furthermore, also welcome Professor Spann and Professor Pletschner, representing uh, the board of professors at the CDTM. We're very happy that you are also joining the uh, finals of the Trend Seminar. And welcome to everybody in this room, friends, families, and friends of the CDTM. I hope you're as excited as we are and as the class of spring 2016 is. And also, one more thing, welcome to the people who are watching us online at the live stream. Uh, we have uh, people from all over the world from the WFP program who are interested in, the, in this uh, trend seminar. And uh, thanks to Kilian from the management team of the CDTM, we made a live stream uh, working now. And that's also the reason why I have these two microphones here because at the Center for Digital Technology and Management, we're not ashamed to have a microphone for this room and a second microphone for the live stream. <laughs> Having that said, I'm not sure if everybody knows that the topic of the trend seminar before it actually starts is always top secret. Only the CAs and the project partners know that. CAs, that's the center assistant. And especially we, the trend seminar team, that is my colleague, Laura, sitting there in the front, Myself, my name is Florian, and the two of us, we're also part of the management team at the CDTM, and we kind of guided the last seven weeks the trend seminar of the CDTM. Most importantly, or in the most important part of the trend seminar team, the class of spring 2016 itself, sitting there in the first row. And as said, the topic is always top secret. So I would like everybody to have a little thought experiment now at the beginning. Because um, you really, I'm not sure if you can imagine it as they did, but just imagine seven weeks back, you're sitting into the first floor uh, of, the, of, of uh, this uh, room here, of this building, and you're sitting in the, in, um, on your chair, and then your CDTM technology management program starts. And you sit there, and then there's this guy walking in front of the stage, that was Mario, and they had no clue what they will be working on for the next seven weeks. And then... Everything that Mario did, he said, hey guys, I have a video for you. And I want to show you the same video. Sarah, it's always a beginning. But in 15 years, we hope it will be an ending. Another zero. We spend our lives trying to overcome it. Because we always want more, without realizing that millions of people need to reach that tiny, simple, beautiful number. Zero. Zero is our mission. Not a mission to Mars, but straight to our hearts. A perfect circle, a ring around the Earth. 
achieved together. It's a nothing transformed into an everything, a huge number, a result we can be proud of. The beginning and the end. The world has set a global goal of 50 years to stay up on Join us in our global movement. Support the World Food Programme because together we have one future with zero hunger. So I hope you can imagine the faces, the excitement and the respect of all the students. I was actually quite excited when I looked into the faces and I really realized, okay, they are really motivated, they're really interesting and to actually understand what they have to do. <laughs> and uh, then they got the introduction to the topic, fighting hunger in the digital era. Uh, quite an interesting and challenging topic, as mentioned in the beginning, but uh, Laura and me, we had the feeling that they really made something out of it and they really enjoyed working on that. But let's have a short recap before we start with the actual content. Within the last seven weeks, we probably used more than 1,500 post-its. And I want to that the class of spring 2016 looks at this photo for a second. <laughs> Every CDTM alumni probably remembers also the driver matrix of the scenario phase. Uh, took us a while to come up with that uh, picture. Furthermore, there were more than 15 hours of coaching and even the good weather didn't uh, um, step back to having a coaching session with the student groups. But in general, it was just seven weeks of excitement, uh, working day and nights, having uh, sleepless nights at the center, having nights where people slept at the center, but in general, seven weeks of uh, very challenging and motivating and inspiring time. Or also, as we in Bavaria sometimes say, seven times Weiss was through Stück on Friday morning. And what I really would like to emphasize is here that the students took any effort that was needed to really put their minds into the right setting <laughs> to really concentrate on the topic, how to fight hunger in the digital era. Put that a bit more formally, the students worked at the beginning in a basic phase and now I think it's also the right time to say thank you to all the external and guest lecturers that were part of the basic phase. We had people from the World Food Programme, we had people from the Social Entrepreneurship Academy, and we had uh, people um, giving input on to present, uh, presenting and also content-wise. So thanks again, whoever is watching on the live stream or the video afterwards, thank you very much. After the two and a half weeks, we then continued with the scenario phase. In the scenario phase, the people, the students, worked on four future extreme scenarios, and you will hear about these scenarios, how possible futures might look like in a very extreme way in a few minutes. And last but not least, the very important ideation phase. In the ideation phase, um, the students came up with a lot of ideas how to fight hunger in the digital era. And finally, the outcomes, the five winning ideas, uh, will be presented in the course of this evening. With that being said, this was the introduction, if you haven't noticed yet. Uh, we will now continue with more information about the basic phase, the trends, the scenarios, the ideation phase, and then we will have the pitches for the final ideas. And now I'll hand over to Chiara, who will, and Peter, who will present the introduction to the trends and basic phase. Thank you, Florian, for the introduction. And also thank you, Laura and Florian, for helping us through the trend seminar this uh, past vacation time. It's really been a pleasure. Um, so, Myself, Chiara, along with my colleague Peter, are going to be introducing you to the first phase of our trend seminar, which was the basic phase, where we looked at a lot of the major trends that influence the fight against hunger in our world today. So I want to reiterate what was said by Florian before. We were truly honored and uh, thrilled to be working with the World Food Program on this really important topic of our world today. And I think I can speak for everyone to say that we put our hearts and souls into this to make sure that we can give you the best solutions to possibly fight hunger in the digital era. So that's what we'll be presenting to you today, first in the form of trends, then scenarios, and then the final ideas. 
So thank you again. So once we got the trend topic, a lot of us maybe who don't have a background in what's needed to fight hunger, we need to get a big introduction to the topic in the background. The second part included input sessions from experts that are both on the ground from the WFP and from different organizations who were able to work on site with people that are starving from hunger around the world. This really helped us to get a view into those people's lives and how we could help them best. Finally, we took this information and set out to do our trends research in which we looked at all the trends that are influencing hunger today in the world and created a report which we will now share with you on how these will affect the world. So the five trend areas that we looked at were technology, society and environment, political and legal trends, economy and business models. And now I'll hand it over to Peter to talk about technology trends. Thanks, Chiara. Technology plays an even increasingly important role in our lives. We have become more connected, effective, and have a knowledge of a world at our fingertips. This is why also governments in developing countries are increasingly investing in information and communication technology infrastructure, like cable or cellular networks. And these investments are paying off. Almost everybody in the developing world now has a mobile phone. And why we're not necessarily talking about smartphones, these mobile phones enable the people to be connected not only locally, but also on a global level. In some developing countries, mobile payments are the mainstream way to make and receive payments in a secure manner. But all these phones produce huge amounts of data, which lead us to the next trend in the technology area. Right now, about 40% of all generated data worldwide is from developing countries. And by 2020, it is expected to increase to make up the majority. By then, all this data will not only be from mobile phones and computers, but will also be from smart devices, small things that have sensors in them, but the capacity to generate large amounts of data. These large data sets are complex to analyze, but advancements in machine learning make it possible to generate insights and knowledge and provide governments and NGOs with a possibility to monitor their community or the country in near real time. The next trend area is about the changes in our society and the environment. Since the Industrial Revolution, our world's population has grown from 1 billion to over 7 billion people. And while the growth rate is slowing, the overall numbers are increasing. An increase in urbanization has led to large, overcrowded cities, often in areas where food security is already on a very low level. Additionally, in a lot of developing countries, we saw a growing middle class with an increase in purchasing power. This led to a transition from a more traditional subsistence lifestyle to a lifestyle that resolves around higher consumption. The next trend in this area is about culturally appropriate technology. It is assumed that the expected effect of aid is impaired by 50% only due to cultural differences. This is why the new generation of aid is not only about helping in immediate moment, but also focuses on capacity building to help the people to help themselves. An example of that is appropriate technology. Appropriate technology is about building people-centric products only using locally available and renewable resources that make products that are easy to maintain. You can see an example of that on the right side of the slide. This is a pot-in-pot -pot refrigerator that is made entirely out of clay. It works just as a normal refrigerator, but it only uses locally available resources and is easy to maintain. Chiara is now going to walk you through the next trend area. So now that we've looked at the technology trends as well as the societal and environment trends, we're going to take a look at political and legal trends which influence them and the other trend areas from the top down and provide the structures in which these trends can thrive or survive. So one of the major trends that we looked at, especially for our scenarios phase, was the growth of industrial agricultural farming, also including the growth of GMOs or genetically modified organisms and crops, as well as monocultures. This is something that's a trend that's growing worldwide, also in developing countries. And it can have one of two effects. 
the case with the increasing uh, industrial farming is that you can provide more yield in the area. However, industrial farming also requires a lot of inputs like fertilizer and machinery. So if you have a monoculture and your crop goes bad, you could lose everything. And that's something that provides a bit of risk for smallholder farmers who may overcapitalize on their machinery and their farm tools, but then may not be able to make up for it. Um, the next trend in political and legal is corruption. This is a trend that unfortunately has a gigantic influence on hunger directly. However, due to its secretive nature, it's not very easy to control. As you'll see later in the phase of ideas, we might be able to fix this through digital technologies, especially blockchain technology, which takes the fingers out of the proverbial cookie jar by not allowing people to even get in there. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to show you in the future how this can be solved through our ideas. In the next area, economy, going similarly with the growth of the world agricultural market, not just industrial farms are growing, but also the food industry. As you can see on the right, there is the appearance of variety in our food brands. However, they're mostly controlled by a few large companies. These companies can influence global food security in one of two ways. They can either decide to make more profit, raise their prices, they could make food less available for very poor people who can no longer afford it, or they could use their responsibility and power to actually enable people to buy food, to subsidize it for them, or possibly also to allow people to pay a small premium in some countries where other people can get the food for a lesser price. That's up to them. But for the time being, we can use digital technology to provide monitoring and transparency to make sure that the companies abide by laws and by policies that will help people in the future. The next section involves two business models, which we believe will be helpful in the fight against hunger. The first one is the sharing economy. Um, and this one may seem new to people in Western countries. However, it's the way of life in many people in Africa, for example, where societies are mostly uh, characterized as being communalistic instead of individualistic or competitive. So actually, a sharing economy would most likely be very well accepted in these countries, even possibly more so than in our society here. This would do two things for people starving from hunger. The first would be increasing the utilization of farmers' production resources and also uh, requiring less investment for growing food. For example, you could share a tractor or machinery so less people have to buy the upfront capital in order to grow the food in the future. The second business model um, is value chain inclusion. This one's very simple. You need to include the small farmer both as a producer and a consumer in the value chain. And by doing this, you provide them with higher income for more farmers and increased market coverage for food supply. This is done in the fact that you buy directly from small farmers or you allow them to purchase directly within the food supply chain thus not leaving them out and not having money siphoned out in an upper level. Thus, farmers get the money that's paid due to them, or people can have more food in their area to buy to help them survive. So now I'll hand it over to Peter to talk about the intro to the scenario phase. Next, we're going to take a look into the future. But before we do that, we want to share some impressions with you from our teamwork during the scenario phase. <laughs> 
What you saw in the video was the first part of a scenario phase. We had an extensive and demanding workshop that showed us how we can develop scenarios that are not only possible, but also plausible through a structured process. And as part of that process, we selected key drivers that we think have the highest impact on fighting hunger. Once we had two key drivers, we laid them as a foundation for four different scenarios where each scenario paints a day in the future in the year 2036. On this slide, you can see our two selected drivers, one being the amount of collaboration between governments and the other being the amount of genetically modified food. Our four scenarios are ranging through all extreme cases, where one has a world where we have no collaboration between governments and no gen genetically modified food, to the extreme opposite case, where we have a complete collaboration between governments and all food is genetically modified. We're now going to introduce you to all four scenarios, starting with a separated new world presented by Toby. For the first scenario, I want to introduce you to Rose. Rose lives in Nigeria in the year of 2036. Rose lives in a separated new world, a world that has been shaped by the lack of international collaboration and the lack of international organizations like the UN. It has only one remaining food supply, that's GMOs. Let's get back to Rose. Rose gets up early these days because of the extreme temperatures that are caused by the climate change. When she gets into the kitchen, her husband Obi has already left. He works for the military at the border to secure it. Once the collaboration stopped, there was conflicts breaking out all over the world, especially at the borders. Once Nigeria forced Boko Haram to leave their territory, they built a wall to keep their population safe. In Nigeria, there's only one company that has control over the whole food supply chain. This is because they established a monopoly over the GMOs. They have gained huge political power, both locally and internationally, and taken over social responsibilities, like leading the school that Rose is teaching at. Thus, there has been improvement in food supply throughout the world. There are still some countries that suffer from food, from food shortage and extreme poverty. Because there is no collaboration anymore, there is no humanitarian aid. This leads to huge refugee streams all around the world. Even so, Rose and Obi would really like to help them. They can't because in their country, civilian activity is restricted. Next, we will have Mike with Powder to the People. Thank you, Toby. Perfect. So I want to introduce you to Nia. She lives in Kenya in the scenario Powder to People. Now, the world in this uh, scenario was shaped by the downfall of government co collaboration and GMOs. GMOs were shown to be, well, have, they have adverse health effects and a negative impact on the soil conditions. Contemporary government collaboration broke down due to complex crisis and increasingly opposite national interests. But back to her. What does an average day in her life look like? At 6 a.m., she might get up, broken by her smart wristband because wearables are already commodities in Africa by then. She then starts to prepare breakfast out of three rations of nutrient powder. This is not much for a family of three, but still more than they had five years ago. Back then, the millennium famine was at its peak. They left the city and went to the countryside, where many small communities formed. Now, she's working in this village. At nine, she starts her workday where her job is to evaluate aerial images of the fields taken by drone the day before. She ha has the responsibility to plan which amount of the harvest is processed together with farmed insects to nutrient powder. This has become a necessity because free, uh, the food shortages strike more frequent than before. As the day passes, she, might, she may think about the harvest celebration in the evening. It has been a good year. She smiles. Now that you have a glimpse what a day in her life might look like, I want to quickly sum up what uh, the key aspects of our scenario were. 
government collaboration broke down because national interests, interests of governments rose and protectionist policies did as well. As this happened, human, humanitarian programs were cancelled. Thus, many countries couldn't support the food demand in cities. And many pe people went from cities to the countryside where small self-sustaining communities were formed. Thank you. Next up is Yingxi with her scenario. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, um, welcome to the world of Bob, the world of food network. Bob is a 17 year old. Usually his day starts with going to work at the vertical farming plant in the morning and then go to online courses in the afternoon. However, today he has a different agenda. It is the mother, uh, it is the birthday of his mother and he wants to give him, give her a surprise, a piece of steak. Starvation and hunger is no longer a problem in the world of Food Network. However, everyone is calculated to be distributed a precise amount of calorie per day, and they are measured by a body meter that is connected to your body and system. An extra food is not allowed in the World Food Network. If they were, they were extremely expensive, such as meat and dairy products. That's why Bob has saved for two months of calories in order to give her, his mom this surprise. After work, he rides his bike, and then he arrives at the black market to get some meat. He watches the dealer to swipe up almost all his remaining calorie away, and then he carefully packs the meat back to his back backpack. As Bob is riding home, he could already imagine the smiling face and surprises looks of his mom when his mom sees the meat. So maybe from this story, you can already imagine that the world in the 2036 of Bob is a world with limited amount of food. This is due to the extreme cultivation of GMO that caused the irreversible damage to the soil in the majority places in the world and causing a global food crisis. And therefore, GMO is no longer allowed around the world. And um, in addition to that, there's a global government evolved to in being in charge of the distribution, the production, and the supply of the food worldwide. So now let me allow me to introduce LACMA for our last scenario, the greenhouse of the nations. Thank you, Yingxi. So the last scenario is the greenhouse of nation where we have the total collaboration between countries and also complete food production is based on GMO. Let me introduce to Peter. Peter is actually from uh, UK. He's studying uh, in Greenhouse of Nation of the era of Greenhouse of Nation. He's studying biotechnology, but right now he's in Uganda in a research center to research more about how to sustainable development of the GMO technology. And he likes the experience because he gets to, to meet a lot of new people and experience new cultures. And in the era of greenhouse of nations, this kind of research, res, research exchanges are fairly common because all the countries are contributing and they want to share their knowledge. He has so many friends from Uganda. One of his best friend is Chris, uh, who, who is from Uganda itself. And he's also working in the same research institute. And in their leisure time, they talk about their past experience and past life. So Chris tells Peter one, one day that how hard his life was 20 years back in 2016, where they did not have enough food to eat and due to the less economy and the poverty, how they suffered. But now Chris is really happy because they have a, they have a GMO food production where they can, their, farmer, uh, their parents who are farmers in Uganda have a stable food income and have stable occupations as well. But he also mentioned that his grandparents who are from the previous generation did not like the GMO uh, farming industry because of all the wearables and gadgets which came up with the GMO industry. It sounds like a great world where everyone is treated equal, but there are some challenges as well. For an example, they recall an incident last week where 10 people got sick due to some of the GMO-related food infection. So with the technology involvement, there come some health challenges as well. But Peter and Chris, they are both happy to live in Greenhouse of Nations because it's a world without conflict, war, and everyone has an equal opportunity to have enough food. 
So to quickly summarize our four scenarios, you might be wondering why we talk about these extreme situations like separated new world, greenhouse of nations, world food network, powdered people. The basically, we, we found out that there are so many scenarios, but we consider these extreme situations so that we can plug our business model and see how future-proof they are. So that's the basic idea of the scenario phase. Thank you very much. So, and now we, um, we have already heard about the first two phases of the trend seminar, which is the basic phase, the phase in which we sort of set the baseline knowledge that we will build up everything else upon. And then afterwards we heard about the look into the future, the scenarios, how the future could possibly look like. And then now what we are doing to talk about now is the, set, the third phase, the ideation phase. So we now go back from the future, back to the day, and look into solutions that could already today help the WFP to solve their challenges. However, I imagine having heard all the trends and all the scenarios, you already have an idea that talking about fighting hunger today and also tomorrow is a highly complex issue. A highly complex issue with so many different uh, factors involved that it's very hard to really narrow it down to this one solution. So for the ideation phase and for coming up with very concrete solutions, we were thinking and sitting together with our project partner from the WFP to define the most relevant questions to have a more targeted approach for the ideation. So what we did is that we set two major areas to be the focus points for the ideation phase. The first area that we defined is the far smallholder farmers' productivity. For, for smallholder farmers, um, a big issue today is the access to assets, to information, to training, and all the relevant knowledge that they need to get the best out of their yield. This is why we had two ideation teams of the trend seminar directly focusing on this topic. The second topic, still a big challenge for WFP, is how to enable a, a tr transparent and an honest dialogue with their beneficiaries, so with the most vulnerable people on the ground. How to identify what are the most relevant needs, who is really in need for help, and also how to help them and what are the most, uh, what could be targeted solutions here as well. So these are the, and then another two trend seminar teams ideated on that topic. However, the most brilliant ideas usually um, come out of a, of a not targeted uh, approach. And this is why we said, okay, we also want to uh, include that idea, idea pro ideation process to have different approaches of idea generation in us. And this is why we said, okay, not only, uh, we will not only ideate on two targeted approaches, but we will also have a certain team which ideates without any restrictions and to be able to also go beyond the topics and look into different directions. And with this approach, you try to um, cover all different kinds of needs for a WFP to tailor their questions. <clears throat> One special thing is that usually we directly start with uh, the ideation in the student teams. But for this time, we said, and for the first time in CDTM uh, history, sort of, um, we started with an open innovation challenge. So um, among our colleagues, there's uh, Veronica Gamper, and she's doing her PhD research on ideation tools. And together with stu two students, um, Class Miners and Alexander Schenke, who is also a uh, CDTM student, they developed a tool where everybody across borders can contribute ideas and ideate together without uh, being restricted to your location and the peers around you. So in, we invited um, a big amount of people um, to bring in their ideas on the three topics that we just mentioned. And so they could enter the tool, ideate, uh, give their, bring their ideas in, discuss with each other, challenge each other, rate on the idea, so here you can actually see two screenshots of the tool. And then <clears throat> the most, like the highly, uh, most highly rated uh, solutions were taken into the next step uh, with the students to ideate upon from um, in a two-day workshop with our partners from IICM in Munich, Institute for Innovation and Change Management. And um, so the students ideated on these ideas, took them further, the best ones. They also generated new ideas and um, took those ideas then even further into the next week of the trend seminar. So taking these two approaches together, 
We are uh, very happy and say a big thank you to more than 100 participants uh, all over the world in 15 different countries and 40 different cities who um, joined and, and ideated together for making the ideas that we have today. Um, <clears throat> 25 of them were, were selected to go on a short list and then the 25 we set together again with our collaboration partner to pick our five winning ideas, which you will see today. So this was the ideation part. But an idea is always nothing if you cannot implement it because then your solution comes not into place. So after having the ideas in mind, there comes the very last phase of the trend seminar where the idea has to be transformed into an ideally self-sustaining sort of business model, in our case, be it a social one, be it a for-profit business model, we didn't, did, we didn't do any restrictions on that, but we said, okay, your ideas should also be self-sustaining. <clears throat> and so transferring these ideas into the, uh, the self-sustaining business model, and then also, and here we come back to the second stage of the trend seminar, checking if there are future proofs. So in the ideation presentations later on, you will see that each team evaluates their idea based on the different scenarios that we just encountered. Because what we want to find out is, um, <clears throat> even if some of the scenarios might seem highly unlikely and highly uncertain, to be able to, to navigate through complexity, you have to get to know them and you have to check if your idea is also future-proof and could work in different future scenarios and not only in our current setting. <clears throat> And with that being said, we are finally at the point where we will start with the ideation presentations. We will now hear before the break the first two ideas um, on smallholder farmers' productivity. So we will hear the ideas of Tuber and CropSpot, but I will not, not spoil anything about them. Instead, hand over to Yingxi as the first speaker of Team Tuber. And uh, the stage is yours. Yay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. It's me again. <laughs> so we're Team Tuber. Tuber is a mobile platform for tube-based agriculture services among farmers. So this is Farmer Jack. He's on his last mile harvesting all the crops. There was a lot of rain in the last season, so the harvest was great. However, he doesn't seem as happy as we expect him to because he knows that half of his crops will just be rotten in the field. According to a study conducted by FAO in 2013, more than half of the crops cultivated in Ghana will never make it to its final consumer. This is because in most of the developing countries, their entire agriculture is only dependent on weather due to very poor infrastructures. So when there were a lot of rain in the past season, then there will be a lot of harvest. However, there will also be an oversupply of food in the market. So farmers like Farmer Jack cannot sell their crops. And also because they lack of appropriate storage to store those crops, all the, all the food will just be rotten and wasted. On the other hand, if we have a bad harvest, meaning that the rain was not very good in the last season, then there's a shortage of supply in the market. So the food price becomes very high in the local market. And for those people in the urban areas who does not cultivate food themselves, and the ones who can also not afford the expensive food, they are the ones who are suffering from hunger. So, storing the harvest could actually solve a problem which causes a lot of hunger. But how can we achieve this? One solution would be a drying machine. Because just by reducing the moisture content in grain to a level of 12%, the crops can be stored for more than a year. So why have farmers not tackled this problem yet? There are three reasons for it. The first reason is 
that most of the farmers simply don't have access to those tools. Secondly, the income of the majority of the farmers is simply not high enough in order to buy tools like a drying machine. And the last reason directly relates to the general bad education in developing countries where farmers are also affected from. But the question is, do farmers really need the tools? Or is it not rather the outcome of the tools, what farmers like Jack really need? So, like the dried crops. This is where Tuba comes into place. We do not provide tools, but a platform for farming services. But let us give you an example. On the one hand, we have Farmer John. Farmer John owns a drying machine and has the knowledge to use it. On the other hand, we have Farmer Jack. And as you know from the story, he cannot afford a drying machine, but still needs to dry his crops in order to store them. So now, Farmer John can simply offer his drying service on Tuba, and Farmer Jack can book this service there and pay later on with a share of his harvest income. In order to raise the awareness of our platform among farmers in developing countries, we could, um, the WFP and other local NGOs could promote our tool. And now Christian will tell you how to launch our product. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> so how can we launch our product into practice? Normally, in areas where hunger is present, those tools are often not available. Therefore, we have an entry strategy where we buy the tools in the beginning ourselves and then rent them to the farmers for a small fee. We also teach the farmers how to operate the tools and to maintain the tools. This allows them to increase their own yield, but also to offer the service to other farmers via our platform. Once Tuber is established, then the farmers can buy our tools with their increased income. This is how we can go from community to community to increase the coverage of agricultural services. So far we saw the example with the drying machine, but obviously this is only a small part of the whole production chain. Altogether, we really face a multi-layered problem, which can be divided into four categories. Each of these categories should be improved and also could be improved by the usage of tools. First of this is irrigation. Irrigation is a precondition to enable farming during dry periods. The second one is the production itself, where a lot of different tools can be used to increase the agricultural output. The third one is the storage where we already met the grain dryer, but also other tools can be used to improve this sector. And the last one is transport, where, for example, shared vehicles ease the transport from the, of the food from the farms to the cities. And here, Jubal steps in. Jubal tackles all these areas collectively. That means Jubal supports to offer agricultural services in each field across the whole production chain. And now Adrian will tell us something about Tubo can also operate in the future. Thank you, Chris. So now let's see, or let's have a quick glimpse at the future and see how Tuba will perform in our scenarios. As you might see, Tuba has the possibility to thrive in two completely opposed scenarios. The reason for that is that our idea is not dependent on the two main drivers, but what really is important for us is one specific outcome. To what extent is the agricultural production consolidated? So our main target group are the smallholder farmers. Only if they can still produce, if they are not pushed out of the market by big corporations, we can provide some value. Now that we know how Tuba works and also what impact it might have in the future and how it might perform, we can to advance to a very important part, the business model. One of the first questions we asked ourselves is, how can we scale up? How can we reach the communities and spread our idea to the people? From the marketing perspective, we really decided to take a very simple approach. We want to cooperate with the WFP and the local NGOs, since they first have a very good reputation and they might even know the local decision makers, like the local chief of the communities, who then can promote our idea to each farmer who might be interested. For the distribution, we want to employ skilled and experienced farmers 
who transport the tools into the villages and teach the farmers on how to use them. Maybe even more importantly, we also asked ourselves, how can we get financially sustainable? Very crucial part, of course. We faced that we have three main cost factors, development and maintenance of the platform, paying the teachers we want to employ, and of course, also buying the tools we want to provide to the farmers. Therefore, we want to cover our expenses by two revenue streams. First one, as said before, would be charging a small fee to the farmers when we provide them with the tools. And as a second decision, we also decided to charge a small fee whenever we provide our uh, contact information on the platforms to the farmers who want to get in contact. Now Mike will tell you something about the challenges we are going to face. Thank you, Adrian. So as you can imagine, uh, starting up a platform like Tuba doesn't come without challenges. First, since we operate in rural areas, we will have an issue with transportation and infrastructure. Second, as we have an uh, entry strategy where we buy the tools ourselves, we will also make, have to make sure that they are insured. For the platform approach to work, we certainly need a critical mass of both customers, farmers and service providers. Maintenance is another big issue. And finally, we are a mobile service, so obviously we are very dependent on the mobile coverage in the regions we operate in. But we think it is really worth overcoming these challenges because Tuba can have a great impact in any of these areas. First of all, we provide access to tools for farmers, which can then increase their productivity. Additionally, for the service providers, we give them a perspective, a vision and additional income. We also believe that our service can provide value to the WFP. First, passively, because we are fighting hunger and we are doing this self-sustaining. Additionally, as a project partner, we can provide them with information about the regions we operate in. And finally, for the society, we see that we can increase food security in the regions and also we might create an upward spiral in the food industry there. Finally, we also create cohesion within communities through our platform approach. Now this is why we believe that Tuber can have an impact on fighting hunger in the digital era. Thank you. So now for the Q&A, uh, anyone who has questions? Yeah, Marius. So, so very interesting. Um, have a question on the mobile platform. Yeah. You mentioned quite a lot how the assets are going to be shared, but what would be the role of the platform? Okay, so the question was, uh, we mentioned uh, here how the assets are shared via our platform. Marius asked, what exactly is the role of the platform? Wants to answer it? Okay. <laughs> then I can. Then I will do it. So basically, the idea is uh, that this platform will provide. Uh, the platform provides a way to communicate over uh, the areas, over the borders of different communities. So we can really connect those who have the tools and the time, also the training, and those who need services. The idea is that uh, first we want to use SMS. Uh, based uh, SMS based service since uh, most people there don't have smartphones yet and then really connect those who need services with those who can provide them maybe also to add on that we want also to track the people so they have to for instance provide their location and also the time when they want the service to either to provide the service or to um, get the service and then our platform that would maybe be the main operational part of the platform would match the two nearest people together in the community so that not some um, platform uh, participant of Nigeria would be connected with one in Uganda for instance because that would of course not make sense. Maybe over there. Uh, Again? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, we talked already a little bit about it. We want for the marketing to cooperate with the WFP. 
and also the local NGOs. So what we would maybe like to do with WFP to sit together and really discuss about the needs, but also about the wishes of the farmers they got to know. And then, for instance, since they might know the decision makers there, they could explain the whole idea to one village and we could implement it there. And then when, when we have implemented the idea, we really also rely to um, yeah, spreading the word among the farmers. So that would be the second stage. Yeah, so we want really to go about institutions. So the question was, who takes the risk for our services we um, connect? So the thing is, the, if something goes wrong with the dry cleaner, then it would rely in the farmer who offers the service. Because um, they offer the service and they are therefore responsible that uh, yeah, they offer the right service and they do it right. But um, other aspects are more on the side of the farmers who offer the services and this is why we have here the challenge of insurance if it goes about or is it if it is about the maintenance of tools and so on and there we really think about to cooperate with uh, insurance institutions that we can also uh, offer an insurance for the farmers who offer the, the service so we know that from another startup here usually they have something uh, uh, with an insurance and this is what we also thought about yeah Um, yeah, I think that's a very Im interesting question. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe I will repeat the question first. So why should the farmer who's, who has then the tool and also the knowledge how to handle it, provide it to his competitors, the other farmers, and not only seize the opportunity and go really la on a large scale in industrial farming, pushing out the other farmers, if I understood it right. So I think first we also might have to acknowledge that they have ma maybe more a sharing approach, especially within the communities. So if we provide the service in a community, the community is really much about sharing. So I think that could help us there. And I think um, there are major bottlenecks. If so, if we only provide one tool, he won't be able to scale up immediately. But what he would be able to do is gain additional income by helping the farmers with his specific tool. So that's also some bet we are also, of course, taking. So just to repeat the question, it was about the seasonality of the usage of tools. And we are aware of this problem. And this is also why we, for example, came up with the drying machine. So we want, in the beginning, use tools where it's not that limited in time, so where you can uh, do it over a longer period. And there, it, also, it really gives a benefit. For other tools where it is a very short period, you will have this problem, and it's hard to really solve. That is, we are aware of that. But we also thought about it should be 
something like a change in the agriculture that you have a more uh, more diversity in the agriculture that you don't have all the fields to harvest on the same time but you have the, the one the sort one of plants at field a and the other one at field b that you get with this uh, more time spots where you can use the tools that you not only can use it once in a year so this is how we want to tackle that um, I would want to add one point that um, actually many of the operation in those villages are very primitive. So they're really using the very most basic hands and tools. And actually, if you we apply any of the more advanced tools to reach a kind of semi-industrial farming, then there would be more than enough land just waiting to be cultivated. And this is also what we have um, what we have known through interviewing some of the people who are actually from Africa and those regions who actually studied agriculture, that um, they really need the tools because they have much more land than they need to waiting to be cultivated. So uh, the time, I mean, the tool is not a problem, but just that um, they would actually want more to be cultivated. Okay, if it's possible. So the question, or those are two questions. First is about infrastructure, and the first one, how to, um, what was the thought? <laughs> <laughs> the infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure is the first question, and the second question is the private land ownership. Exactly, the private land ownership. So we talked, for example, to an expert from Ghana, and um, he said us on the one side, there is no real security there. On the other side, it, it's very easy to get land to farm. So they have enough land to farm. They can increase their fields without any problems, but they don't have the tools to do that. So of course, you have an insecurity that you might can't do it next year again, but I think this is not that high risk. And about the streets, of course, there's also a problem. I'm not sure if we had it on the slides. We discussed it. So it's not our part to buy the, the streets and to finance that, but of course we have to look in which region we want to go if there is enough infrastructure already there, and also how maybe we can, um, yeah, if we use tools, they also have to move from city A to city B anyhow, so it should be not that big problem, but of course the time would be longer to move with the tools from A to B, but that's it, yeah. And I think uh, we are running out of time, so we finish our Q&A session, and thanks for your attention. So good evening, everyone. Thank you again for being here for our final presentations on how to fight hunger in the digital era. We are Team CropSpot, and we are very excited to present you a mobile solution to automate crop disease identification empowered by image recognition and machine learning technology. Now, before we will go into the details on how it works, I would like to explain to you why crop disease identification is crucial when it comes to fight hunger. Globally, 20 to 40% of yield losses are caused by pathogens, insects, and weeds. However, the developing countries, and especially smallholder farming communities within these countries, are often even more affected. 
that shows an example of the recent past in Kenya, where corn production decreased to 90% due to a disease called mild necrosis. Now imagine you would be living in Kenya, then corn would be your staple food. You would consume 300 grams of corn per day. Leaving out corn would be like eating a sandwich without bread. In 2012, the amount of corn that was lost due to inefficient diagnosis and treatment of the disease caused equals one million people not having corn for a whole year. So how can crop spot help smallholder farmers to prevent yield losses? Now, um, imagine me being a smallholder farmer who lives in Kenya. So I grow corn on my farmland, and I'm also in the unlucky situation. Um, I'm also in the unlucky situation that I'm uh, that my crop is affected by an unknown disease. So what do I do? How does it work for me? So what I do is I take out my smartphone and I take a photo of the most essential parts of my crop, such as the bloom, the the root, or the leaves. The next step is that I take these photos and I upload them to a mobile solution, a smartphone application which we call CropSpot. It is designed as a chat interface to keep it as simple and as user-friendly as possible. So what I receive then is an instant identification of the disease I'm dealing with. And following that, I get also treatment recommendations as, as to how I would act upon the, the disease my crops are affected with. So in my case, I just learned that my, my corn is actually um, affected by the maize lethal necrosis. So by using this smartphone application, I, I'm able to tackle two problems which are often, pre often prevalent in developing countries. So one of which would be that I usually would have to reach out to my community leaders or to other, to other smallholder farmers in order to get advice on what to do, um, which can be really difficult if I live in a remote area. The second one would be that although these, these people might be able to give me some advice, I, I'm not sure if they give me the best solution out there. So by using th this uh, mobile application, I can be sure that I access a global pool of knowledge and I get the best solution possible for me. Um, so next up, we're going to take a look behind the curtains and see what happens between uploading the photo and instant identification of the disease. Thank you, Patrick. So now we're going to see how the technology behind CropSpot is going to work and what's the difference between an online forum and CropSpot. So basically what we are trying to do is we're trying to bridge a gap between knowledge, a uh, person who tries to get the knowledge and person who has the knowledge. So basically like online forum, you ask a question and you get an answer back. But it's not scalable and it's not real time. So that's the problem we are trying to solve by CropSpot. And uh, imagine that you are a plant disease expert. So when you see a new picture of a crop disease, you can easily identify that, okay, this is the disease and these are the recommendations and precautions that you should do in order to get uh, uh, to a better position. But how do you do that? It's all in your brain. So in order to understand how the crop sport technology work, we just, we just have to understand how the brain works. So in your brain, you have a lot of past memories, uh, past images of different diseases if you are a plant disease expert and when there's a new picture you just compare that new picture with the old images that you have in the brain so then you kind of group it which we call the classification and then you can easily identify okay this is the disease this is exactly what we are doing with crop crop spot uh, building a building a model using the two buzzwords that we used before image recognition and machine learning so we acquire images through various open source image collections uh, which have disease uh, infected crops and leaves and then we send these images into two way process one process we get the expert opinions via different cloud source platforms who knows the stuff and see the picture and say okay this is uh, have the reason you have the white spot in this leaf is this and then we send the same image to an image processing unit where we extract the features like what is the color of the leaf what is the shape of the leaf etc and we have two set of information which we feed into something called the machine learning model you can simply imagine that is your brain so you have the uh, input from the expert and you have the image pro 
via the image processing, you have the features of the uh, lips. So that is getting trained uh, similar to how our brain gets trained. And we, do, we don't do it only for one picture. We do it over and over again for many pictures as we can. Once the model is pretty, pretty much trained to handle new pictures, we call it the crop spot bot. <laughs> And when there's a new picture coming up, uh, like Patrick explained before, so the crop spot board will simply handle it as a human brain and give you the recommendation. And if there are something new, which, is, which cannot be handled by the crop spot board, then we also redirect the farmer to expert like Lisa to get more recommendations and precautions which are not provided by our uh, automated system. So now you know in a high level how the crop spot work, but how, how much financially sustainable our idea is, let's find out that next. So as with every good idea, there's a lot of good ideas, but the ones that are financially sustainable are the ones that stick around. So we're going to show you how we're going to do that with crop spot. At the launch of our application, we won't have as much user data. So we're going to start off with two main sources of revenue. The first one will be in-app advertisements. This will allow us to connect the farmers, who are the target customers, with companies that provide the solutions, such as pesticide, herbicide, or seed companies that would provide the solutions to the crop diseases. We could place this ad, for example, in between the screen where you upload the photo, and then you receive the result. The second solution would be product placement. This could be very simply in the form of the recommendation. This would be non-biased and controlled by experts, but you could also include a link, an affiliate link, that brings you directly to the company's website where you could buy the product in any amount that you need, and you get a, a percentage of the sale as CropSpot for bringing the customer directly to the company. Now, as we gather more data over time from our application, which would be in the form of photos and data uploaded by people all around the world using CropSpot, this data could become very valuable for companies, governments, and research institutions. And we could monetize on this data in two ways. The first way would be real-time crop disease data platform, in which, for example, governments could log on and watch the spread of crop diseases in real time and be able to use that data to prevent their spread in the future and create new measures. This would also allow for pattern recognition and planning and monitoring of crop diseases. Secondly, once we have even more data from the application, we can provide valuable industry reports for companies and institutions. They can plan their new supply and also plan research for the future. Now I'll hand it over to talk about the challenges and their possible solutions for application. So every good idea comes with challenges. How can we overcome them for CropSpot? Since we are a smartphone application, we obviously rely on smartphones and internet coverage. Yes, that is a challenge, but it's a challenge that's going to solve over time. So in five or six years, almost everyone in the world, also in developing countries, will have access to smartphones. A big challenge in developing countries is the high literacy rate and also the number of many dialects that are spoken. So we are going to use voice recognition and real-time translation services in the long run to overcome these language barriers. The core of our product is automation to make it scalable. How do we automize it? We use an algorithm. And how do we make the algorithm work? We need training data. As mentioned before, for the initial training, we are going to use open source databases that have crops, images of crops and their diseases to train it. And then going on, we can use the crowdsource data, so what the farmer uploads, to further optimize it. Last but not least, most important resource is also the expert knowledge. So in the short run, so for the getting the app, uh, the app up and running, we are, need to pay the experts to give them our knowledge. But in the long run, we can use the mentioned data and reports to incentivize universities and research institutes to ex exchange their knowledge against our data. So once we've solved all these ch challenges, how will the future look like for CropSpot? So the most or the best case scenario for CropSpot will be no GMO and full collaboration. Why? Because no GMO means there are still natural diseases and that means a demand for our service. 
And no collab or full collaboration means full international exchange of knowledge amongst experts. Well, no matter which scenario comes into place, we have a clear vision for the next 20 years. So we want to significantly reduce the number and the spread of diseases around the world. And to do that, we're going to enhance CropSpot and extend the service to an early warning system. By analyzing and using the data that we generate, we can warn about diseases, where they came up and when. So the UN, WFP, for instance, can use it to take precautions and the farmer can use it to proactively take actions and save his harvest. So CropSpot means less diseases, which means more yield to fight hunger by 2036. Thank you very much for your attention. We will now take any questions. Yes. Yeah, so we, we have platforms like uh, the question was basically uh, asking that how we are going to and find the experts and where are they located? And the second question was how long would it take to train the model and itself? So we have platforms like uh, if you have heard like Amazon Mechanical Turk where you have you can submit a task and get the people to do some special kind of a work assignment. So those kind of platforms have similar expert and also once our app is up and running there would be some people who would be participating in the app just because uh, you want to show your knowledge to the outer world for an example stack overflow you just go and uh, post a question uh, it's like a computer science platform where you post a question and you can get many answers so people would like to show that you know this stuff so once our app is up and running that would also be a platform to get experts and other than that there are already as i said amazon mechanical Turk, where you can go and find such experts yeah and it, it all depends on the speed of experts that we are getting. So the uh, number of images that we need to train. So the duration depends on that. So we, we have to look for how many diseases that they are currently existing. So we are currently looking into that. Like for an example, if there are 1,000 diseases, what, at least 1,000 images for each disease, it would be 1,000 into 1,000. So that decides the duration. So we have to decide based on that. Maybe just to add on that, um, you wouldn't necessarily need a model that can handle all the diseases that are out there. So you'd also prioritize and start off with certain diseases that affect, uh, for instance, um, mice and start off with that. So we don't need to wait till the model can handle everything, but we can set out the app already using certain diseases. Um, through our research in the initial phase, we found out that it's a combination of both, actually. So there is the case that sometimes you're not able to afford the actual pesticides or treatment that you need, but it's also often the case that, especially with new diseases or unknown diseases, um, they're simply, like, they don't know how to cure it. And oftentimes, if you don't really know to whom you should go to to answer this question, that's kind of where the knowledge train stops. Um, so it's also the issue we found in some of our expert sessions that even though a lot of people have smartphones, uh, there often isn't the knowledge or the knowledge trail where you can figure out where you get the exact information you need through a step-by-step -step process. And that's something we're hoping to make a bit more streamlined by having it just be a one-click process. Thank you for your question. Perhaps slightly connected to that question. The solution might be constrained by what they have available locally. Yep. How are you considering to include that restriction? Uh, do you mean technology or crops or both? No, so solutions like uh, pesticides or chemicals or even traditional solutions. 
if I'm an expert from other country, mm -hmm. I will not be aware of what you have available in your surroundings. Okay. So how would you sort of include that restriction in the suggestion to say you have disease A, ah. and given your available resources, you should do this. Mm -hmm. I had the idea, we thought about that, and I can hand over to one of the tech guys on this, how it would actually work would be you could use something that's location-based, and then from there you could figure out what your resources are. But Yeah, you, you answered it like into halfway, so what you're suggesting is a localized system where you have a, uh, where you get the international input as well, but the solutions that are coming up more uh, shaped towards what you have in locally. So in order to do that, I, I think one challenge is to find enough experts in the local area which who who knows about this stuff and also what we found out is that farming is that although you have local knowledge but when it comes to a large picture there are many common diseases as well especially when it comes to crop diseases and how to prevent that so the international knowledge is very useful in our platform but as a next step we can probably think about as uh, sophia mentioned when you localize the things and also along with that also shape the solution according to the locally available resources but that would be like a next step so add one more thing to that. I think a good um, comparison would be to like medicines. So you oftentimes for uh, different symptoms, you can have many medicines that can cure or alleviate it. So same with crops, you have different solutions that have different levels of effectivity, but then also are available in different areas, different countries. So if you had a list of them, you could use the localization data to choose the ones that are relevant to you. Yes. Okay, so I can take that question to start. So for the farmers, if we're going to be start to target farmers in developing countries who need this app mostly for the survival of their crops, we wouldn't have them pay in the first place. So with the first steps with the advertisements and in-app advertisements and the product placement, uh, you'd be getting the money from the company side because you have then direct marketing to a, a customer group that they usually wouldn't have access to. Um, and also, one of our thoughts for the later stages wasn't included in the presentation, but you would have almost sort of a subsidy model where if you were to extend this to large industrial farms, say in the US, that they would pay a subscription model for this as possibly a more customized solution, and you could use that extra top up to pay for the money possibly lost and offering it for free. And then the data in the second step would um, pay for itself once the flow comes in. One more question, maybe? I, so the question was, how do you pro tackle the problem of literacy? Um, we actually thought about this one for a long time. Uh, in the first stage of our app, we don't think it would be ideal to put it in um, because we need to make sure that initially you're getting enough data and that the recommendations are secure. So you could use the app theoretically if you couldn't read or if you were literate um, to get to the point where you take the photo. But the problem is then the recommendation because oftentimes you would include then the name of the disease or how to treat it. The idea we had was you could use symbols for that or possibly in the future um, voice notes in different languages uh, to tackle that. But that would be something that would come in the later versions because, um, yeah, it would have to be translated in all to local languages. And uh, yeah, so those were our ideas for that. Oh. And that's also my question. We're talking about fighting hunger. Very poor people. Why should anyone pay for ads on your app if there's not anyone using that app who is able to afford anything on it? I think that's a very good point. I think also for the app, um, we'd have it be not just for farmers in developing countries, but those ads would also be seen by farmers in developed countries. So you could have the revenue stream coming from that side. I didn't hear your question.
here to be close to these farmers. They don't need a map like this. It's a developing country solution because we others have supply of information concerning this question. I think that's a very good point, and I also actually studied environmental agriculture in my bachelor's, and I do agree with you that that is the point that we have to look out for, and that's something that comes with the solutions. We wouldn't just be offering solutions from companies like, for example, the ones you mentioned, but would also be offering localized solutions in the companies based on, um, for example, localized crop rotation or possibly natural solutions. And this would be based on country by country where your stuff is available, and also to make sure that it's based on the price range you can actually afford. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so um, we are all almost coming close to the break and I'm sure all the teams are also happy to have further discussions and you can take all the remaining questions outside and discuss with the teams. Also in the back of the room outside, there are all the posters. So each team created a poster for the idea and I'm sure they're happy to answer more questions and take in further feedback to further develop the ideas. So um, before we get to the break, um, let's have a little other like thought experiment with you, which will then actually directly, uh, directly lead into a real experiment we want to conduct with you during the break. 2,100 calories. That's the average amount of calories a normal person should take in per day to be able to lead a healthy life. That's also the amount of calories that uh, the WFP has in their food packages and care packages that they hand out to their beneficiaries every day, for instance, in refugee camps all over the world. So you might wonder, 2,100 calories, what's that? How much is it? It's very abstract. So let's have a look, and I'm already very sorry for all those who didn't have dinner yet. Um, so what we have here, 2,100 calories, we have an apple, we have some cereal, some Brussels sprouts, chicken, salad, a Coke, water, a glass of wine, so lots of work. We also could turn it into a, I think, cheeseburger with fried onion rings and a big, large, diet, uh, not Diet Coke, of course, um, at Burger King. Or we could have a cowboy rib eye steak one pounder thing with a martini and three olives or this double caramel sh uh, vanilla shake with a little cherry on top or we could have a glass of chickpeas we could have this glass of chickpeas this is also 2100 calories but the question is not how many calories this is the questions that we now have to for you for the break is how many calories are these how, uh, how many chickpeas are these? How many peas are in the glass? So this is why we invite you for a little guessing game. And if you haven't done it yet, please go uh, on the, in the outside, uh, have a look at the glass, estimate the number, go to the link here, guess.cgtm.de, insert your estimation, and then after the, after the break, we will reveal what's it, what this is all about. And now we'll enter into a 20 minutes break and happy to talk to you.
Okay, to the people in the live stream, we will proceed in around two minutes. Uh, people start taking the seats and we are happy to welcome you back in a short amount of time. So, um, if everybody could start taking their seats, then we would like to proceed. All right, so I hope you all put your uh, guess into the, the chickpea guess into our website, but we will not reveal the secret yet. You will still have to stay tuned for that and hold on for a little while. And uh, nevertheless, what we will do now is that we will enter the second block of our um, ideation presentations. Now we are going back from smallholder farmers productivity to a new and enter a new topic, which is the communication uh, and enabling a true dialogue with beneficiaries of the WFP. So as said, the challenge here is how to ensure transparency, how to ensure and identify the people um, that really need help, um, that those are tackled, how to hear the voices of the most vulnerable people. And for that, we will have two teams again presenting their ideas. First team, Team True Stories, and then the second team is Team Faircast, which will reveal the chickpea secret. So, and with that, I will hand over the microphone and the stage to Team True Stories. Thank you. We'll quickly see the presenter. All right. <laughs> This is the Zatari refugee camp. It's one of the many places where the WFP is active. 100,000 people live here. But what do we really know about their lives? There's 100,000 untold stories. And this is where we come into play. We believe everybody deserves the opportunity to tell their story. And that's why we present True Stories, a platform designed to help people tell their story. Meet Ben. He lives in the Zatari refugee camp, and he has a story to tell. So let's give him a smartphone, right? It has a True Stories app already pre-installed, and it provides him with internet access, so he can connect with his friends on Facebook and also educate himself. Of course, the smartphone also sports a camera, and Ben uses his camera to record short videos of his everyday life. Turns out Ben really loves soccer, so he filmed short videos uh, of uh, kids uh, running on the soccer field that was recently built by his local NGO. Let's see how the True Stories app uh, works from here. Ben already re recorded his story, and he now proceeds to upload it to our platform. On the platform, he can also rate the videos of other beneficiaries, and in return, receives more internet access volume, so he can keep on using his phone and keep recording his stories. Our platform is where the donors can then watch the best rated videos of the beneficiaries so they can really connect with their lives. If they uh, decide that they like a project, they can then donate to it. So Ben's uh, local NGO can really keep up the good work. Lucas, why don't you tell us more? <laughs> of course. <laughs> So um, this is what uh, the True Story app might look like from a donor's point of view. 
you have here uh, the story Ben just recorded with the smartphone. Um, you can have like a very um, cool uh, video compilation you can flick through with very so short videos, like 10 seconds each. Um, and we have then different beneficiaries which take video. But we don't only have the Satari refugee camp on there, but as time continues, we uh, expand our portfolio of projects uh, all around the globe. Um, and then uh, you can see them in a very uh, simple to use overview where you can retrieve additional information about the NGO, um, about the impact your money is actually making in, uh, in this particular project. If you then are convinced by the project and um, decide to donate, you can do this. It's really easy. We make it so big that you can't miss it. Um, and we take care of all the payment information um, and then donates to a project. We build with True Stories a direct communication channel between uh, beneficiaries and donors, which haven't been possible before. Uh, and we think that we have a big market uh, potential because of two reasons. First one is that um, True Stories tackles the top uh, three pressing issues why people don't donate to a project, which are, I don't know what I'm donating to, True Story uh, will tell you uh, what the project is actually about. The second one is others don't donate, so I don't donate either. We tackle that with um, social sharing features so you know uh, which friends are actually donating. And the third is uh, the problem is too far away and out of our reach. Um, True Stories will bring it in a pocket. Second one is um, donations are actually uh, through smartphones actually doubled in two years for um, with apps like share the meal and we think we can uh, achieve a similar success with the true story concept mary claire now tells you more about what it takes to bring this concept out of the office and into reality if we want to connect donors in the developed world to projects and stories in the developing world we have a big task ahead of us. Some of those tasks involve starting a two-sided app, which serves both as a platform for storytellers and creators to upload content easily, shoot videos, and access the videos of other creators. We also need to make that accessible to donors in the developed world who can see that content, connect to it, and donate at the click of a button. Uh, furthermore, we, the biggest problem probably is getting smartphones and internet access on the ground in developing countries, as we don't have full saturation in those regards yet. What we foresee is partnerships with uh, mobile technology and internet access providers who are interested in accessing emerging markets, as well as nonprofit project partners and local NGOs. For, for the creators and storytellers in the developing world, the, one of the biggest incentives for using True Stories is in uh, getting this access to the internet, not only for rating and viewing content from other creators around the world, but also in order to gain access, training, um, and knowledge in other fields. True Stories wants to make an intervention in the current model we see in aid and, aid and philanthropy in the world. Rather than seeing beneficiaries as passive recipients of aid. We want to make them storytellers and creators who are sharing equally in a sharing economy between the developing world and the developed world. In this sense, they, they have something and we have something and we want to exchange them. So for, for creators and storytellers, by telling their story, they're also beginning to tell their own future. So now we've seen all the amazing things True Stories can do. Let's take a quick look at the underlying business model. As we've seen, our main customers will be NGOs from all around the world who really benefit from the possibility to offer their donors uh, a direct and clear channel with unique and authentic stories. For this, we will charge a basic fee, which will, however, never really exceed the amount of additional donations that they receive through our platform. In addition, we're also are thinking about premium services which might include professional video editing or even in-app challenges. On the other side of the donation platform, we have the donors, such as you, and you will also have the opportunity uh, to really support our initiative and increase our further impact. Um, the option to also include sponsored content on the smartphones that we give out uh, will not be a uh, pr priority at first, but could be a great lever in the future. 
So all in all, we think that these revenue streams, including the seed capital, will be more than enough to cover our cost. And this is especially also the case because our core product is the platform and the apps that we develop around it. So this means that once we are finished with the development, uh, the, the cost structure of True Stories will actually be very slim. So once we face a challenge of how to get the smartphones to the donation uh, to the um, project partners on the ground, we believe that True Stories will be able to expand very quickly. So we might actually start in cooperation with WFP at the Zatari refugee camp, but we believe that the True Stories model is built in a way that it's really scalable to more and more projects, all kinds of different contexts all around the globe. So now let's see if our project actually fits the scenarios that we've presented before. First of all, we see it's fairly independent of the GMO driver. However, it is affected by the global collaboration. And this is just due to the fact that global collaboration always fosters digital collaboration. We see a fit in all four scenarios. Now, as with every new idea, there are some challenges that we have to face. Let's have a look at them. First of all, we have to reach our donors. We have to make them see the benefit that we see in our project and make them use it. Next, we have to ensure quality. We have to ensure basic quality, both in diversity and in the video quality. Diversity, because we want to show them every part of the life of our beneficiaries. Next, you've already heard about how we want to motivate our users. We want to give them internet access for their content. But how do we motivate the users that actually bring our platform forward with their content? Because it's just so good. Now. As we, as we face those challenges, we think that true stories will actually be a lot about a lot more than just stories. Let's have a look about what's possible. First of all, we want to implement a platform where our creators can sell their content and thereby become entrepreneurs. Next, we include private projects. This is not only private pers people, but also small NGOs that can show their ideas to the community, and if they like them, they will be implemented. Virtual reality, everyone is talking about it. But once this technology will get cheap enough to be spread among the countries, we can use it as an empathy machine to show the life of the beneficiaries. Last but not least, there's private companies that do value chain inclusion. They spend a large amount of money on this, and we can provide them both the platform to create the content and the community that will watch it. Now, we are true stories. We want to give people a smartphone because we think everyone has a story to tell. Thank you. Okay, so any questions? Um, yeah, so the question is uh, why the idea is not established yet. Uh, and I think there's probably two reasons. Uh, for one, uh, starters, we already mentioned in the, in the trend analysis that the, the, the spread of smartphone is really only in the last couple of years really picking off. So now we see phones like the Freedom for, uh, 252 in, in India, which uh, is supposedly come out with only like a cost of $5. And so we think that right now is actually a really good time to get into that market and to um, uh, because the smartphones are getting cheaper and cheaper. And we also believe that uh, the cooperation with the, plan with the NGOs is really important at this step, so that if we uh, really go over a couple of big projects, we will start uh, yeah, to dive in deeply. I think it's also a growing trend in humanitarian aid to be looking for feedback and looking for the voices of the people you're serving um, aid to. And that's, uh, I mean, it's been simmering for years, but I think it's really coming to a fore now. Um, donations don't go directly to the content creators, but to the NGOs. So, uh, as 
Okay, so it's actually a very good question. It was about incentives, uh, also on the on the donor side, but uh, also on the beneficiary side. And maybe just start with the donors. So what we're kind of thinking of is that you still donate to a certain project. You, so you would still sort of donate to the Atari refugee camp, but uh, in comparison to other platforms before, maybe now you really have the insight of videos taken from that platform. And we originally started off with the idea maybe to really make a one-to-one -one connection between beneficiaries and donors. But we think that through this idea, we can actually cluster uh, maybe only a number of people who actually have smartphones on the ground, and but still reach a big uh, amount of uh, people at the, um, yeah, at the local project. And on, on the side of the beneficiaries, so we would give out the smartphones and the main incentives would actually that they receive internet access. So we would say maybe a couple of videos every week or something about like this. And uh, if they do this and if they also rate other videos, then they will receive internet access in return, which they wouldn't get if they uh, stopped uh, uploading videos. And uh, you were right about the fact that they don't really know the exact impact that their videos are making, but we believe that uh, just by knowing that you sort of contribute to your project and maybe there are some ways that we can really uh, channel this into a uh, direct feedback to the persons who actually upload the videos. Okay, we have another question. Oh. And as you've seen in the Outlook, there's also private projects that can be included and this will directly affect the life of our creator and we'll be really close to the project. Yes, I think this will tackle the issue as well. Yes. Okay, um, we uh, talked about the power creators uh, in a part, and we think that um, we want to. Uh, Essentially, you give, uh, you don't keep the smartphone for unlimited time, but you have, have the uh, smartphone over, let's say, two weeks or something. Um, and if you have like better content than uh, the average, you uh, can continue to use the smartphone. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we um, might actually um, give uh, this one creator an audience and uh, maybe. Uh, get him to uh, know higher people in the filmmaking industry because then we have actually a talent there. So um, this is like the incentive to make good quality content. Okay, so I think we might have time for one more question. Yes, please. Yeah, um, one question has to do with the influence of incentives. Um, so how, in an incentive-based platform, can you ensure that the stories remain true? Um, we thought about this as well. Um, we also had some discussion about whether there should be actually like financial incentives for people who are creating content. And there was some discussion of whether that would make the content quote unquote less authentic. But I think at this point, you're already giving someone who previously didn't have the opportunity to tell a story, who previously didn't have a smartphone, that opportunity. So I think on that level, it's already more authentic and we don't need to really like um, split hairs over like whether they get to tell their authentic story or how authentic it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, and it's also from the donation perspective. Um, like, how are you on the transparency side? Yeah. Um, for these NGOs, like, how can I know that the story that's being told is is a true representation of what's actually happening? Because it could be worse, it could be better. And um, so, what kind of like verification? Well, the, the verification system for determining content, I don't know if this was like missed at some point, but um, it's also done by other creators around the world. So they get to decide what they think is the best content that ought to be the top stories on the app. Um, and yeah, that's the. I think that was basically all the quest questions we have time for. Sorry. It's, it's to the same point. Yeah. Yeah, we've thought about digital literacy incentives as well, or uh, rather initiatives, uh, because that is a major issue is like, if somebody's never had a smartphone before, how are they gonna make the content? So that's that's something we're also thinking about. Um, yeah, digital literacy for sure. 
Well, I think uh, also part of the question was maybe, uh, I mean, we're really targeting at first people who never really had a smartphone before and people who are not really uh, home in that uh, uh, yeah, landscape that we are so used to. So we actually think that by having your first smartphone and being able to record your activities around you, I think it's also maybe a very new scenario. And I don't think there's maybe that much focus yet on generating likes or these sort of things. But it's actually a good question. And of course, this will need to be tackled. Yeah. So thank you very much for the, for the questions. And yeah. That's <laughs> 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 I soon will reveal the mystery. But let's start with something less. Let's just clap for some more. Johannes had a good night. Yeah, sure. Get our console. Was es los, oder? Ich glaube, da kriegt man an. Hat sich, glaube ich, aufgehängt. Ja, genau. Bildschirmpräsentation. So. <lacht> Danke. All over the world, we are affected by crises. In this century alone, we had the huge floodings in Thailand, the nuclear disaster in Fukushima, and more recently, the conflicts in Syria. We can be grateful that humanitarian organizations like the WFP exist and help the people when they need the help most. They help the people by providing emergency responses, bringing the people food, shelter, and build up infrastructure to allow them to live a normal life as far as it's possible. But these emergency responses are expensive. Where the WFP uses early warning systems to identify problematic areas in an early stage and allow them to plan ahead. They also set up a dedicated organization that specializes in gathering the data from various sources and organizations and combine them into predictions and demand forecasts. But these forecasts are currently missing an important source of information, and that is the voice of affected people themselves. And this is why we'd like to present you with an additional approach today. Let's go back to the jar of chickpeas. We actually counted them yesterday and those are your guesses. Actually, in the diagram, we include, uh, excluded one guess uh, that was 10,000, so too, too far on the right. <laughs> the number we counted yesterday was 1,417. And one of you had a very accurate uh, guess of uh, 1,412. And that was Simon Nusch. Great job, Simon. Uh, great. <laughs> um, many of you, on the other hand, had a pretty high deviation of the correct results. However, if we combine all your guesses into one estimate, it becomes very accurate. 1,392 is the average of all your guesses, and we included the 10,000 guy. Um, and it's not a fake. If you don't believe us, uh, we can show you the Excel file afterwards. The underlying principle is called wisdom of the crowd, and it's increasingly used, for example, in prediction markets to forecast very complex events. 
by letting people bet on the outcomes. One example is political betting. On a CNN website, you can bet on who will win the uh, US presidential election. By the bets people take, an algorithm calculates how probable it is for each candidate to win. This system has a track record of being more accurate than polls. And for example, in 2012, it was right for 49 out of 50 states in the US for the presidential election. It's now also used by companies like HP and Microsoft to predict their revenue because it's more accurate than as expert estimates. Prediction markets are a way of forecasting complex situations very accurately. So how will the WFP benefit from that? The answer to that question is Faircast, the social betting platform for future predicted together to gather all of our knowledge. So let me just walk you through on how Faircast actually works. On the one hand, we have humanitarian organizations just like the WFP. They are our clients. The WFP might be interested in how many refugees will arrive in a certain region within a specific time frame. On the other hand, we have refugees or other people with certain knowledge on this particular topic. They can contribute their information they got on Faircast in form of bets. On Faircast, as Johannes mentioned before, there is an algorithm that calculates and takes all bets into account and estimates the number of refugees that is most likely to actually arrive. This prediction is then sent to the WFP in form as a Faircast, as we say, or as a forecast. Let's look how this platform could look like for our users. For simplification reasons, we say there are four outcomes that they can bet on. The actual question of the WFP is now how many refugees will arrive in Turkish refugee camps in May 2016. Also, let's assume that this is the most accurate result, between 20 and 40,000 refugees. By betting, for instance, $2 on this outcome with the odds of 1 to 2, you can get $4 back. The WFP, on the other hand, receives a distribution of probabilities, which looks like this. The WFP can then plan their resources and capacity way more accurate with those informations. So by betting on this result, you can actually make money on Faircast. But a question that we also want to answer today is, how are we going to make money? Thank you, Janis. That's a very good question. First of all, we're going to charge clients like the WFP a one-time fee for them to be able to post our, their question on our forecast uh, platform. Secondly, like usual bet platforms, we're going to charge each placed bet with a small percentage fee, which is realized through uh, reduced odds. <coughs> Thirdly, if our prediction was accurate, we're going to charge an additional bonus for that. So our business model contains three revenue streams that contribute as a source of income to the surplus of Faircast. But what's actually fair about Faircast is that we entirely donate our surplus again to humanitarian aid organizations. These receive valuable information in the form of predictions for them to be able to react as early as possible. Secondly, every user receives a test money account with which it's already possible to uh, win material reward prices. And secondly, uh, if they decide to use real money, of course, also that. But what's even more important, with every bet, they're contributing to help solve burning societal questions and challenges. So they might also gain social status by that. Thirdly, even if you lose, you're still contributing to a good cause. Thank you, David. So, but there are also some challenges. First of all, Faircast is based on the wisdom of the crowd and therefore relies on a huge user base. This means, especially at the beginning, we have to acquire a lot of users. We plan to do so by doing some social media campaigns and distributing signer vouchers. Secondly, Faircast involves some betting elements. And since we are a social business, we don't want our users to get addicted. 
That's why we plan to limit the user activity to, let's say, one or two real money bets per week. And thirdly, there might be criminals trying to influence refugee streams. Those criminals might be betting high amounts of money to very high or very low refugee numbers with very high odds. And afterwards, they might be trying to make their bet come true in order to win a lot of money. That's something we definitely not, do not want because it could cause a lot of harm. That's why we are restricting the amount of money users are allowed to bet to a certain amount in order to um, avoid such a behavior. So as you can see, there are some challenges. However, we believe in Faircast's future. Thank you, Hagen. <clears throat> so if we have a look at the scenario matrix over here, we can see that in 20 years from now, Faircast will probably work best in the World Food Network. Because of international collaboration, the exchange of information, and high migration, various parties could benefit from, from Faircast's predictions. But also in the other three scenarios, we can find useful applications, such as the prediction of crop failures. So these scenarios provide a far outlook. But what about the near future? Faircast is going to start off in the area of migration and aims to position itself as a reliable and accurate prediction service provider and a betting platform with a positive social impact. But Faircast's use is not limited to the area of migration. In the future, Faircast could also be used in order to predict other highly relevant topics such as food prices. Furthermore, Faircast could also target corporate clients in order to increase revenues and thus surplus, which can be donated. And last but not least, Faircast could also be used in order to foster the dialogue between humanitarian organizations such as the WFP and their beneficiaries. This could, for example, be achieved by including a vote-based comment system, which rewards users for sharing valuable information on questions that are currently being predicted on Faircast. So this is Faircast, and now it's on all of us to predict our future together. All right, do you guys have some questions for us? I think over there on the left side. All right, the question was a uh, concern on the restrictions that we want to implement on Faircast. And I think David can answer this question. Um, yeah, so we had an intensive talk with uh, some guys from the WFP, uh, including Mario, about that. Um, and what they suggested was uh, just referring to the call that we had. <laughs> uh, and you, ha you should answer, no. <laughs> so, um, as I said, uh, we're going to provide initially a test money account. And one idea that we had in mind was um, do it location based. For instance, if somebody's really like at the border of, of Turkey or something to, um, to make his bet vo um, count more. Like we had uh, uh, your votes, we could have uh, um, given additional weight to our votes because we knew uh, the numbers, for instance that is biasing the system and we are again facing some other challenges with that, but it would be an option to actually give some more weight to a certain uh, uh, person, uh, beneficiary in that case. So the question was um, payment uh, related, so uh, do, um, bet side 
paying the bet and also uh, being paid out. Um, can I? Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so first of all, we had this also in another group, um, especially in Africa, for example, there's a company called Mpesa. Um, uh, it's like, I think, a collaboration with Vodafone as well. So they actually use uh, feature phones, so old Nokia and so on, as actual bank accounts. So um, that's also something that we thought of is you could even uh, go beyond smartphones and just make it SMS-based, for instance, with which it would then also include using M-Pesa as a, a payment partner. And so you could be just asking the question via a, a so-called SMS channel, for instance, saying, uh, what do you guess uh, is the number of refugees uh, arriving in a, sp a specific area? And then you can answer it with an SMS and then also be charged for that SMS with the amount of money that you would like to bet. So that's something that we thought of. And also uh, other payment partners would be like PayPal and so on. So you don't need an actual bank account to be able to set that up. Mario? <laughs> One comment and a question comment first. There is, a, a, I think, another opportunity, which is by the time you will be able to identify the super poor clusters, meaning people that normally are spot on using secondary data, not necessarily on the spot, but using satellite or whatnot. That's something that in US, I cannot remember now, the institution did this in several several uh, years and managed to identify the super poor clusters. Is it Imani? Then the question. Okay. Yes. No, no, that was just... <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. Yeah. The question is, in, in, in elections, you know for sure the outcome, and you say, yes, it was uh, uh, Peter Clinton or X or Y, etc. In this situation, it's very hard to say how many people actually landed. So how you plan it to sort of tackle that issue? <laughs> okay, obviously, we all expect it. Um, so the point is, um, obviously, this is this is a challenge that we have, um, and we want to repeat the question first. And <laughs> the question is, how can we verify how many refugees, for instance, landed at that specific point, right? Exactly. So we intend to work together with institutions that are working on the floor. So if, for instance, we want to predict how many refugees arrived in Turkish camps for the WFP, we can ask the camps from the WFP how many refugees came there and then distribute the money equally after having verified this particular result. It should not only be the WFP, it can also be other aid organizations or also research institutions that we highly collaborate with. So, I think David has an add-on on this comment. It's also the reason why we're going to charge you guys with a one-time fee in the beginning. <laughs> Um, because we somehow need to verify uh, the number that the question you actually had. So uh, it's, um, depending on the questions that you have, the amount of the one-time fee is going to rise. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Yeah. One more question. Uh, how do you want to make your um, attractive for investors to donate all the refugees? Um, who wants to? I talk too much. <laughs> Shall I take it? <clears throat> you, just take it. <laughs> so, to be honest, you also thought about keeping the revenue <laughs> completely. <laughs> so surplus is like, uh, so, well, it might sound strange in the beginning that you guys, or uh, that uh, clients are being charged uh, with an, a fee and then redirected the money to them, which could be an option for NGOs, and uh, uh, humanitarian aid organizations. But as Chris said, in the end, we're gonna uh, target corporates uh, as another source of income, and we're not like probably thinking of uh, taking the surplus just to increase our own expansion, first of all, in order to be then able to get even more precise predictions on the burning societal questions that we have. So that's also an option. So, I th uh, by the way, we have, all of the teams will have uh, their super cool posters outside, and everyone is like then represented, and then you can ask some more questions if you want. And Mario, you, you mentioned the super forecasters. Uh, today, we identified our super forecaster, Simon. And Simon, uh, we would like to invite you for a beer later downstairs. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so uh, we are now about to enter the last presentation of tonight. Um, so we had now heard ideas on the two targeted issues that the WFP raised. So first was smallholders, farmers productivity. And the second idea, or the, the third and fourth ideas, the second part was about enabling a true dialogue with the communities and with the beneficiaries. And then, as mentioned at the very beginning, we had one team um, and also one part of the, of the external ideation challenge um, who ideated very freely without any constraints, just bold and bright, bright ideas. And this is the last team on stage which will present their idea, Bliss. Thank you, Laura. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you because today we want to present the result of our work, BLISS. BLISS stands for Blockchain Logistics Integrated Support System. And with BLISS, we aim to solve a big problem that the WFP is facing right now. In the last mile, our, corp our partner, the WFP, relies on the local NGOs to deliver the food commodities since they are the ones that have the knowledge about the local situation. It is very important for the WFP to be certain that the food they give to the local NGOs actually reaches the beneficiaries. But it's a big challenge to monitor this process efficiently. That's why we believe an efficient and transparent last mile tracking system will have a direct impact on solving world hunger. Let's take a look at an example. Diala and her child live in a refugee camp, and today they did not receive her put their food portion because Omar, another member of the refugee com community, used a fake ID to receive two portions, because the day before, he did not have anything to eat. In desperate situations, fraud is a problem that we have to face. Our goal is to build a, trans sorry. Our goal is to build a transparent last mile tracking system that ensures fair food distribution. By doing so, we will help the WFP fulfill its core mission to feed every person in need every day. Let's take a look at how, how are we going to solve this problem. Thank you, Ferran. So um, now let's go into and see how Bliss technology enables commodity tracking in the last mile delivery. Uh, the last mile starts with the WFP warehouse. So the WFP warehouse employees have to recommission the food they receive on really big pallets to smaller ones, which are then delivered to our cooperating partners or NGOs. In this process, they tag each food commodity with a unique QR code. These codes are printed with our computer terminals and printers. The second phase begins when the cooperating partner receives the food commodity. Uh, he will use our smartphones and mobile application to scan with his camera the QR code of all the food commodities that he has received. With an integrated uh, fingerprint sensor of the smartphone, he can confirm that he is authorized to receive these packages. Also, his location and the time of this transfer are recorded. The final step is when the cooperating partner hands over the food commodity to the beneficiary. And again, he will use the very same smartphone to scan the uh, food commodity he's handing over. However, in this step, it is the beneficiary who authenticates that he has received this package. And again, for location and time of this uh, transfer are recorded. Now, overall, we have a digital representation of the physical downstream supply chain of the WFP. The WFP can now use this information to identify where food commodities were lost, uh, where people defrauded, especially the cooperating partners maybe, and finally, where double serving has happened. All this information is stored in a blockchain. Now I want to hand over to Philip. Please explain us, what is a blockchain and how does it work? Thank you, Martin. So yes, what is a blockchain? Behind the physical process is an important uh, technology. What makes Bliss truly disruptive is blockchain technology because it introduced trust between the WFP and the local NGOs. Let's take an example. We have a bag of wheat that the WFP wants to distribute to the, the beneficiaries. This, well, once, the transaction has, when the, once the distribution has taken place, 
the transaction is recorded on a smartphone as a block. This block is then sent to all the devices in the network, and in this network, all the devices store a local copy of every previous transaction that have, that have uh, occurred within the WFP and the NGO. So these uh, devices can actually compare the, the, the data and make sure it's consistent in order to then verify it and make it valid. This is why blockchain is tamper resistant. Every device in the network holds uh, the same uh, record of, of events, and these events uh, are yes, and these events help us uh, verify the, the the truth of the transaction. Once the transaction has been validated, it is a part of the blockchain, which you might have guessed. The blockchain is the history of all the transactions uh, within uh, the, the the database. This permanent trail of data is very valuable for the WFP. Why? Because the WFP can later access it through our interface and then measure the true impact they have on the beneficiary. With all the relevant KPIs at hand, our tool will help them actually uh, optimize the last mile of their supply chain. So as we see, blockchain holds true potential, but it also faces some challenges. And I will now let Marius explain and address these challenges. Thanks, Philip. So we're using state-of-the-art technology in the physical process as well as in the digital process. However, we identified three main challenges we face with our solution. The first challenge is mobile internet coverage at the place of the transaction. A possible solution to solve that would be to temporarily save the transaction on the smartphone and then upload it and sync it when internet is available again. But it would, that would counteract some of the inherent advantages of an online distributed database like blockchain. A second challenge lies in the tagging process. As a manual process, it is very labor intense and therefore expensive. So ultimately, this needs to be automated. We imagine that, ideally, the tagging process already implemented in the production of the food commodities itself, printed on each individual parcel. The third challenge is storage space. Bitcoin, the most popular popular used blockchain implementation, um, stores the whole transaction, of a uh, whole history of all transaction have ever happened on each individual device. As you might have guessed, that's huge storage. That's like 64 gigabytes, and that poses a huge challenge for smartphones. However, with a slightly different blockchain architecture, private blockchains, this can be solved. We've been in contact with Provenance, a real pioneer in blockchain technology, and they confirmed the technological feasibility of our solution within the near future. So let's see, within the near future, we could implement that. And let's see how it would evolve within the more distant future of 20 years, where our scenarios are situated. Bliss as a supply chain monitoring solution would even be feasible with the scenarios on the left-hand side, where there's no collaboration between governments. There would be very little international humanitarian aid, but we believe that Bliss could be used by governments and local NGOs to feed the people within their own countries. And transparency in that is also very helpful for them. With the best case scenarios on the right-hand side, where we have a global governance and a lot of international, international humanitarian aid, we believe that Bliss will thrive and realize a fully transparent humanitarian supply chain. That means that every euro spent by a donor could be tracked along the different steps of the humanitarian supply chain until it reaches a uniquely identified final beneficiary. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is just one of the inherent, inherent advantages of our solution. And now I'll hand over to Josie to tell you how we want to make this sustainable. Thank you, Marius. Our core mission is to provide a tracking solution that provides uh, transparency and security to, for the, uh, in particular for the last mile of the supply chain process. In order to do so, we want Bliss to be a self-sustaining business that is based on three main revenue sources. First, licensing then payment for reports, and lastly, selling and renting out hardware. In return, we want to pro provide four key values to the WFP. The first one is a lean and automated su uh, supply chain tracking process that obviates any needs for secondary checks and audits. This will reduce work redundancies and also third-party monitoring to a minimum. <laughs> Furthermore, Bliss offers end-to-end -end transparency to all the stakeholders involved in the process, starting from the donors, going to the WFP, and also covering all cooperating partners. 
Lastly, Bliss will also offer fraud pre prevention and a very reliable database because it is based on, um, on tamper resistant and shared records. This means once uh, information is stored and you want to change this ownership history, you need consensus of all the stakeholders involved in the process. Why is this in particular interesting for the WFP? The WFP collaborates on a daily basis with a, lot, a large amount of partners around the globe. However, our vision goes beyond that. We want not only to track the last mile, but actually base the entire supply chain process of the WFP on the secure blockchain. We think that the impact of Bliss goes beyond mere monitoring cost saving or increase in transparency. We regard it as a very important enabler to secure food for people in need. And by doing so, to help the WFP to fight towards the goal of zero hunger. So thank you very much. That was our presentation about Bliss. We are now very happy to answer your questions. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, so this question is a technical question. It's about how the blockchain actually works from a, a mining point of view. So uh, he asked uh, if, uh, like Bitcoin, there was going to be uh, data centers that mine uh, this blockchain and that uh, enable the, the, the right term is proof of work. Uh, with our blockchain, if we use a private blockchain, uh, we don't need proof of work, so we don't need actual data centers that mine uh, this process, and it can work without uh, without it. So, no, short answer, no. <laughs> yes. uh, there are other other there are other methods like proof of stake, or uh, just uh, uh, we permission blockchains where even, uh, some nodes are selected to do the work and not every node in the network. Yes, again. Yeah. Well, as you, you may remember in the beginning, uh, we show the example of fraud with a, via uh, fake ID because in desperate situations, there are like desperate actions. Yes. Okay. So the question is, uh, why should we need blockchain technology, which is uh, super secure and uh, why, don't we don't, why don't we don't take another uh, alternative? Uh, blockchain is more than just security, it's about transparency and about distribution. So centralized systems have a single point of failure, and this is a major problem, uh, especially in times of crisis where there's downtime. And uh, another uh, uh, advantage of the blockchain is that each transaction can be view, viewed publicly, and the donors uh, are very interested in the, where the money went and how it affected the beneficiary. So this is why we should use blockchain and not another technology. Yes, in the middle. So you write, you use fingerprints to authenticate persons that are going to use the food packages, right? So if you're in Japan, from within um, 100,000 refugees, you need to register all of them, and um, you have possibly yes. 300,000 uh, transactions a day where you give out food. So that's computing power on the one hand, and um, there's fluctuation in the scam. So Okay, so the question was, uh, 
how much time do we, are we going to take to register uh, the fingerprints of each beneficiary in, for example, a refugee camp where there are like 100,000 uh, re uh, refugees? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know if you know, but like the, you, you can probably see the, the devices in the Apple Store, which have like just a, use a normal smartphone, and you plug it in, and then it's like a fingerprint sensor on the back. So that would be the, the kind of like a device um, we would like to use in a situation like that. And uh, what we first thought is that in a first pilot phase, uh, they would be like individually registered. But ultimately, we want it automated as well. So the first time I put my fingerprint on there to confirm it, I'll automatically get, if I'm not already in the database, I'll automat uh, automatically get a new ID. So the ID gets automatically created if I receive a food parcel. That's the ultimately automated process we imagine how it would be. Um, blockchain is perfectly suitable to, um, if, if you look at blockchain info, it processes like thousands of um, transactions every second. So the blockchain technology is perfectly suitable to handle a lot of amount, big amount of transactions in a short time. Can you repeat the questions? Uh, okay. So uh, I can. The second question was uh, how do we deal with people who don't have 10 fingers? So people who have been victims of uh, war tragedies. Uh, Yes, well, we can specify uh, in our process which finger we, we, uh, we register. So basically, if it's not the right index, it can be the left index or it can be the right thumb. Uh, of course, <laughs> if a beneficiary does not have uh, two hands, uh, that's a, a problem. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we haven't thought about that. And maybe we should implement another uh, kind of uh, uh, tracking system for these specific people. Yes. And what was the first question? Can you repeat it? So uh, the question was, why do you need this end-to-end -end, uh, technology, and why don't you just use uh, fingerprint uh, scanners on the, in every refugee camp or distribution center where the WFP uh, uh, operates? So uh, interesting question. Actually, um, we the smartphones we hand out to the uh, cooperating partners have fingerprint sensors in the device integrated. So actually, we want to do that. Um, so the, every beneficiary will have its the digital and, um, identity like you proposed. We imagine that if this is too expensive, we can also use the fingerprint sensors like in Bluetooth connection, and they are affordable in, uh, for like $20. So this would also be feasible if you want to uh, not have these high investments for the smartphones. And yeah. And also, why do we want this end-to-end -end, uh, technology? Is to provide information uh, to the donor uh, in the long run. So, yeah, I think we're running out of time. Uh, is there any last question? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, uh, are we thinking about uh, making the different camps uh, communicate with each other? So the good thing about the blockchain is that it's global and that uh, if uh, one uh, beneficiary registers at one camp and then moves to another one, he's on the same blockchain, he's registered in the same database, so there's no need to actually uh, make a whole process of transferring data to one camp to the other.
So, ladies and gentlemen, these were the five presentations, the five business ideas that the students came up with. First of all, I'm very happy that you also asked so many questions because the class, they love asking questions and I'm really happy that you also made them answering questions now. Thank you a lot. And also everybody in the live stream currently still uh, watching these presentations. I heard that we had almost 50 people using the live stream. Um, there are just a couple of minutes more where I hand over to our uh, collaboration partner and I see Bernhard and Mario already standing there. So no many uh, words, I just hand over and they will have some final remarks. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. And first of all, I want to thank all of you. First, uh, all of the participants of the CDTM, but also all of you uh, attending here today. So uh, please give all the participants a big round of applause. No, I, I, I must admit, like, uh, from when we started, like, we at, uh, attended one of these courses, like, uh, in the last semester, and we were really impressed by the results at that point. And we're thinking, you know, how would that look like when you take a bunch of the brightest and the most brilliant students, obviously, that would attend CDTM, that you are assembled here, what would happen if they would then actually work on social impact challenges? And I think this is what, you, what you've actually put together and like all presentations across the board, really it's not only the thought and the uh, blood, sweat and tears that you probably put into these ideas, but also what you saw in the, like the actual the delivery and the slides and everything that you did, it was really impressive for us. So I think that's also something that just for you and your, uh, that you know, we also see that you actually put lots of effort into this. So big thank you again. Um, so just to say, so why, um, like hunger is a real problem, right? So hunger is right now still one out of, out of nine people globally that suffers from hunger. Um, so that's kind of the sad news. The good news is that actually we can solve hunger. And with the ideas that we've seen from you guys today, I think we can actually make lots of progress towards solving hunger. Like obviously as in all startups, one out of nine startups fail, so you have five teams. So you know, uh, <laughs> I actually made a slip, so it's like a nine out of 10 star. So like, actually we'll see, maybe because you have been coached by uh, gr uh, great coaches and you've gone through a, through a process. <laughs> But what I want to say is actually uh, you in where you are in your um, in the state of your life right now. Obviously, you're nearing your graduation and you can think what to do with your life. It's also something where everybody working with the World Food Program right now, we've made, I mean, our choice is saying, okay, we want to contribute to a greater, like actually ending hunger within our lifetimes and within 2030. Um, so one of the things that you can obviously now choose, and I, I see that and it's really inspiring to also see when like the level of motivation and the, the dedication to these ideas that you've presented so that you're saying like, I can see you either be it like volunteering in your free time or maybe even pursuing some career in some sort in social impact. So this is something that I personally also find really inspiring. And maybe if I had had the opportunity early on when I graduated, maybe I would have done that. But in that case, uh, thanks again. And also, as uh, I must say, we will obviously look, look at these uh, innovations and the ideas carefully and see actually what we can do with it. And with that, I'm handing over to Mario, who will talk about a couple of options for next steps. Thank you. Great. We have the clicker. Where's the clicker? Okay. We stole it. Great. So, yes, we ask you guys uh, to, be, to leave everything uh, on this. To, to give the last mile and surprise us. And I think you definitely did, right? Um, so I, I think Bernard already thank you. Um, but I want to share the story of Julie. Julie is a CDTM alumni, and we did kind of an experiment with her. She joined one of our boot camps in, in December. Remember, we just opened last August. So we are just beginning to understand how to best identify and accelerate innovations to end hunger. That's our bottom line, right? So Julie joined 
and uh, she helped uh, Jesus. Jesus is a WFP uh, staff. He's working in Lima in one of the worst slams that are in there. They designed a very cool solution for sort of vertical farming, and we're about to start the pilot phase. Now, Julie, I, I think she really enjoyed the experience, and for us was the beginning of this sort of partnership with the CDTM. And when and now Julie is um, doing a social business with um, a clean energy from Denmark, and she reached out to us and said, hey, we want to go to Africa. Do you know anybody in Tanzania? Sure, we do. So we connect her. So here there are many options, right? As Bernard mentioned, it could be you pursue a career, you run your own uh, startup, and we'll try to do our best to help you. Yeah? Now, there is a concrete call to action, if you will. We know you're doing your own degree, plus uh, now is going to be the design uh, development project, no? So you're going to be extremely busy. But for the alumni or those that do not sleep, we have a call to action. So we are looking for entrepreneurs that wants to join our next bootcamp. Um, what we offer. So we're going to bring you a problem that is worth solving, right? that you're going to be very passionate and proud of solving. The program is going to be two weeks where we'll bring a curriculum of human-centered design. Obviously, you, you already probably know a little bit, but we'll bring real experience. Um, we'll bring also staff from WFP, so people that really know what's happening and what are the problems of the users. And after the, the bootcamp, you'll have the chance to pitch and there are going to be either two options. Either you say, yes, I want to sort of join and form a team with the WFP staff. Or you say, you know what? I want to build my own startup, and, but I need a, a, a little bit of help. I need a help with you to get access to the country where I want to launch my services, or I need some connections with investors. The timeline. So we are calling for applications that you submit uh, in like two weeks. Um, then we are going to run the bootcamp for two weeks, end of uh, May, early June. Then we are going to have this demo day where we bring the WFP staff, but also partners from, from the private sectors that always provide a good uh, lens. And then, as, as I mentioned, there are going to be two options. Either you sort of join for a contract uh, for a short period of time to pilot and test it, or you say, you know what, one of the ideas uh, that we have, we want to push it as in a startup. Um, so, if you're interested, we are just starting to sort of uh, spread the word. To ask for you is either you apply or you help us to, to spread this opportunity. Okay? If you have any questions, we'll ha we, we can uh, sort of discuss further. Before I close, uh, we brought a little something for you to take in, in sort of shape of token, if you can uh, distribute it. And also words from the lecturers that uh, help you in at the beginning. They were very interested in the outcomes. And I think we're, when Bernard says thanks is from ultimately all WFP staff, but most importantly, the beneficiaries that will benefit from your ideas. So thank you so much. Great. So I just uh, checked the Facebook event once again, and apparently we, we said uh, 8.30, uh, the, the time limit for today. And I'm very happy that we've put a lot of buffer <laughs> into, the, um, into the scheduling. Uh, so these were the final presentations of uh, the CTM class Spring 2016 and their trend seminar. You saw um, how the CTM addresses the question fighting hunger in the digital era. And if any questions are, uh, were, are not answered yet, I'm pretty sure uh, the students, uh, they'll browse around outside in front of their posters and feel free, uh, free to approach them. And also uh, the class, uh, don't forget that uh, we'll meet downstairs and uh, maybe have the one or other drink afterwards as well. And thanks again for the Innovation Accelerator of the United Nations WFP to bring that interesting and challenging topic to the CDTM. Thanks a lot. With that being said, we are we have done. A today. All right. <laughs> well, we have still time until 8.30, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll
so we presented, uh, we prepared a little something for you guys that we want to show you. Basically summarizes all those things that we that we tried to do in the last some weeks. <laughs> All right, so first of all, um, we want to say thank you to the WFP on behalf of the entire class of 2016 of the CDTM. It was really, really rewarding. Everybody uh, really could broaden their horizon on that. And I think a lot of us did not even consider to work at a so in the social cause or in sustainable development so far and maybe can now imagine doing this. So we had some sleepless nights. It was difficult from time to time to communicate and to come to a conclusion. But in the end, I think everybody was happy with the results. So thank you very much for trusting us with this really, really important issue. In addition to that, I think our time at the CDTM would not have been the same without two very, very important persons. And we want to also say thank you to those guys. Laura, Florian, or as we call you Flora, we had extreme luck to have you as uh, CAs um, the last weeks. We had an amazing time. Your guidance and support and your patience with us were incredible. And we couldn't think about anything better than to give you an award for it, the so-called Flora Award. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I think everybody's now waiting for refreshments, or as we say in Bavaria, cooles blondes. And um, sorry. And um, lastly, we want to thank you guys um, who are just watching this tonight in the live stream and also just viewing, viewing this here. Um, asking those questions uh, also gave us another input and now we have some new things to elaborate on. So also thank you for the audience for being here tonight. And uh, we will welcome you downstairs in the lounge and also here over there at the posters to talk more about our ideas and also on like having a drink. Thank you very much.